afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to all of you to this uh, very interesting and I would say a futuristic session. Um, the topic is uh, decentralized finance. And, uh, you know, it's not only the future of decentralized finance, but also the future of uh, governance in decentralized finance. And uh, as we take on this topic, um, I'm extremely pleased to have a set of panelists here, very eminent personalities. Uh, they come from different experiences, which I'm sure will be very relevant for us as we are discussing this, uh, you know, uh, I would say futuristic topic uh, today. Uh, so uh, to start with, uh, uh, Hans Paul. Hans Paul is the managing director and global chair emeritus uh, at BCG. So thank you so much for taking time and being with us in the panel today. Uh, we've got uh, Top, and he likes to be called Top. Um, I must mention here that Top is the CEO and founder of BitCub. BitCub is the first unicorn out of Thailand, and uh, it's a remarkable achievement uh, for Top, and we are very fortunate to have him here. He actually comes from the world of uh, decentralized finance, right? So I'm very happy to have welcoming him here and to be a part of this interesting panel. And uh, I've got uh, Akash Shah. Akasha is a chief growth officer for BNY Mellon, a very illustrious background with McKinsey in the past and now with BNY Mellon. And uh, he represents uh, BNY Mellon and of course his thoughts are very useful and welcome uh, because they would be very contemporary from the point of view of how, uh, you know, what we call as traditional finance and uh, decentralized finance are merging together. So with that, uh, I would like to start the discussion. Uh, you know, as I would like just frame, you know, what we're going to talk about today and, uh, you know, this topic of what is DeFi. So, you know, many people do ask this question as to what is decentralized finance. Uh, you know, people obviously know finance, people know traditional finance, but what exactly is def uh, uh, decentralized finance? You know, how does it uh, interrelate with what is blockchain? How does it interrelate with cryptocurrencies? So it's a little bit of a you know, demystifying thought process as to what exactly is decentralized finance. So as we know, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, Bit, uh, blockchain itself, we are aware, is a you know, distributed ledger. It's an it's a immutable distributed ledger, which is kind of a records which can be stored on the blockchain. It's a technology where the records cannot be uh, changed. You know, once they are uh, on the blockchain, then they are uh, immutable, which means this record is permanent for a long period of time. And it's a distributed ledger. It is managed by multiple nodes across the globe. And therefore, many people you know, kind of look at that and it's very difficult to change. Now, the finance activities, or basically financial services offered off the blockchain is uh, what is called as decentralized finance. It's an alternative finance, financial system. It works without any intermediaries. And I think that's the biggest benefit because since it works without intermediaries, you know, a lot of the costs which go into our current financial services, a lot of friction which is there, tends to get eliminated because uh, it works without intermediaries. And of course, uh, working without intermediaries comes with its risks and challenges, and I hope today in the panel we'll talk a little bit about that. So, uh, uh, so blockchain, uh, so, so the, the DeFi has got many applications. So, you know, almost similar to the traditional financial services, uh, today in a, in a startup kind of format, there are many applications of financial products which are now available in the decentralized financial world. They include loans, they include payments, there are exchanges, there's a whole world in there, right? And, uh, and all of this is evolving. Uh, you know, they are uh, in the initial phases, but uh, as we'll see on the next slide, there's been an exponential growth of total value in the DeFi network. So as you can see the graph on the left-hand side, actually it's come down a little bit. It's, it, it had gone up about two, three months back. So from a zero value, almost zero value in 2019, just before COVID, the total value loaded in DeFi today is about $250 billion, which means there are $250 billion worth of uh, you know, assets and uh, you know, NFTs and other things, et cetera, which are today residing in the decentralized financial world. Okay, so you can see the exponential rise, and therefore there's something happening there which you know, we all could, uh, must be interested in. We go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So uh, what and how does the decentralized finance engage with the traditional finance? So we just kind of put this chart up. 
Uh, you know, on the one side, you know, is uh, traditional finance, which is on the right hand side. So traditional finance would be, your, you know, typically your existing financial services, you know, payments, uh, trade finance, uh, you know, bank deposits, which tend to be in a regulated world, right? So on the right hand side is the trade, uh, traditional finance, where there are regulations, there are central banks, there are these uh, exchanges which have got regulations, and there's an entire world of regulated finance which takes place on the right hand side. While on the left hand side, you know, we have depicted, of course, the size of the, of the circle does not reflect the market size. Of course, traditional finance is like much, much, much bigger, and decentralized finance is much, much, much smaller. But technically, on the left hand side are, is, a, is a decentralized finance, which works in a completely uh, algorithmic basis based on smart contracts on the blockchain, uh, which is not regulated. And there are products and features which are already existing in the decentralized finance world. And there's a very interesting world coming up in the middle, which is, uh, you know, it's, which runs off the blockchain. It has got financial products, but these financial products tend to get, are regulated. So there is some, some kind of a handshake happening between the decentralized world and the centralized world, uh, where we are seeing a lot of uh, growth taking place at this point of time. So, so when, when you read the literature on this, uh, uh, when you read the articles on this, uh, the, the world in the middle is the one which people expect to grow in the next three to five year period, uh, you know, while the decentralized world will perhaps grow in a three, you know, five year plus kind of period. And of course, uh, we've got experts today who will talk a little bit about both sides and also what's happening in the middle. Okay, uh, so why is there a need for governance? Now, this is a very important uh, point here because, uh, you know, financial services has traditionally been a custody of, uh, you know, people's savings and investments. So if you look at traditional finance, you know, when the, when, you know the people who go and bank their, their deposits or put the money in a financial institution, uh, they are giving the, the, the money into an institution of trust. And therefore, uh, there are regulations which govern the entire traditional finance uh, world, right? So there are central bankers, there are exchanges which are regulated by the exchanges, and so on and so forth. While on the decentralized side, you know, there is this uh, kind of an open-ended, right? So there's no, no governance, no regulation. So therefore, there has to be some kind of a self-governance mechanism that has to be built. And you must remember here that the decentralized finance world works off uh, code. Right? So there are smart contracts which are written, and then smart contracts can sometimes be written wrong, and so on and so forth. So there has to be certain governance, certain corrective mechanisms which are there, which offsets the risk that may be involved in an ungoverned world. Right? And therefore, uh, governance around DeF DeFi becomes important and may perhaps be an important element of, uh, of uh, adaptation of the DeFi as well. And I must mention here that uh, since the decentralized finance world has no intermediaries, uh, the cost to serve a customer is much less. The cost per transaction is much less. Now I'm keeping, there's a, there's a concept in the industry today that, you know, that there may be energy cost which goes into blockchain which are very high. I'm keeping that chapter of uh, energy around blockchain out. But if I were to ex exclude the energy part of blockchain, the cost per transaction on the chain is much lower than it is in the traditional finance. So therefore, with the mobile penetration taking place around the globe, the opportunity of inclusive financial services is extremely high in a decentralized finance world because mobile penetration, as you know, is like almost 100% in the globe. And while there are 2 billion underbanked or people who do not have banking uh, you know, accounts in the world, uh, you know, almost 70% of that 2 billion actually have access to mobile phones, right? So therefore, there's an opportunity to use DeFi to go and increase, have more inclusive uh, financial services across the globe. But there are risks which are there which have to be at the same time taken care of and managed. And I think that's a key topic for today. So I'd like to now open uh, for discussion, um, you know, and um, I would like to start with, uh, with Akash. Uh, you know, it would be great uh, if you can tell us, you know, your, 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 you know, because you look at it from a different perspective, um, you know, finance, traditional finance and decentralized finance in, and where do you think we are today from that point of view? Well, first of all, Rahul, thank you, and thank you to HCL and to WEF for organizing this. Um, look, just by way of context, what BNY Mellon is, is we're actually a market infrastructure company. And just to give you a sense of scale, every day we have about $48 trillion of securities on our platform. So about a fifth of the world's invested um, assets are in some way passing through BNY Mellon every day. And so we felt very early on, a real obligation to continue to think about the scope of infrastructure, not just in what 
we're calling traditional finance, but to all the permutations and versions of it, including DeFi. So in fact, about a year and a half ago, it was front page of the Wall Street Journal, America's oldest bank, BNY Mellon, gets into crypto. And the headline, like most headlines, was partially true, which is we've decided as a management team, we want to lean in to the world of DeFi. One, to really understand it, but two, we think our long-term role is to be a bridge between the DeFi world and the TradFin world, both of which we think will exist um, and coexist with each other. So broadly, we think about that in three dimensions. It's sort of a, similar to the, the slides here. Um, we see it in, of course, crypto assets, and we see our role of really bringing crypto assets into the main sphere of banking and sort of the traditional financial markets, and that's because people are invested in it. You know, hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions of dollars, are in that wealth, and we have to find a way to keep it part of the banking and regulated markets for people who choose to invest. The second area is what we, where we delve into is stable coins and all of the use cases of blockchain for payments. So we think that, Rahul, you spoke to financial inclusion. You know, it could be remittances. It, it could be a lot of other purposes, but there's just a huge need to make payments easier and cheaper and while still safer. And then finally, tokenization. We think there's still an enormous opportunity to tokenize both financial and non-financial assets, create more liquidity, create more transparency, um, and ultimately make those assets more available to uh, end investors. So we, we look across it from all of these dimensions and um, happy to go into any of them more detail. No, thanks. Thanks, Akash, for that. Uh, Top, what is your view? Because, you know, you come from the left-hand side of the world, right? Uh, you know, you actually, you are a startup, you know, starting from a decentralized finance organization. And uh, why don't you talk about your experience and how has that been and, you know, uh, where do you see this headed? Sure. First of all, hello, everyone. Uh, pleasure to, to be here. Um, from our view, uh, we look at it from the open versus closed system perspective, right? If you look at the internet in, in the 1996, all the governments you know, were fiercely against the, the internet or the idea of, uh, of a person being able to create a website. Right? The government should be the only person who can uh, channel through the information to the citizens. Right? But now it's an absurd uh, you know, idea, you know, fast forward 20 years. Uh, you know, uh, and then with the, an open system of the internet, it allows innovation to foster, right? We have co uh, companies that are thriving in, in an open system where innovations come from anyone, anywhere, right? But right now in the financial sector, you know, all the infrastructures, all the interest rate adjustments, you know, are happening in a closed door meeting. A few people came into a room and decide what should be the best interest rate for everyone, what should be the features, you know, for everyone to use. But that's an, in, in, a closed, in a closed system. What we will be experiencing in the next uh, decade is an open financial web or an, an open financial system where innovation can come from anyone, anywhere, anytime, right? Or I guess the best way to understand or to see this is to use the analogy of, of a phone. Uh, Ten years ago, we had this Nokia 3310 where it's a closed system, right? The CEO orders down that a phone can do three things. You can call someone, you can send an SMS, or you can play a snake game, and that's the end of innovation. But then Steve Jobs came along, and he created this iPhone thing. But he doesn't tell everyone that a phone can now order a taxi, right? A phone can wire money overseas. <coughs> a phone can you know, send money uh, instantly. So innovation comes from anyone, anywhere, from via an application store in an open system. So what is happening now in the financial system in the next few, few, few years would be that uh, banking, for, from my perspective, will become a, a front-end customer-facing part, but all the in-app features will be DeFi, right? Where all the innovations ha are happening in, in an open system. But we had this issue in the recent years where, you know, DeFi guys are like, why, why, West, we cannot control, institutions cannot come in into the space uh, because there's no compliance, there's no uh, you know, regulations, there's no securities. So uh, I think, you know, in the next two years, there'll be a new word uh, coming out and people will be discussing more and more called permissioned DeFi, where we are bridging the old world and the new world together, right? A permission DeFi is when you're creating a, a, an upper layer, you know, a regulated uh, upper layer as a gateway to whitelist the address, 
right? To KYC the customers, to you know, to remove concerns with risk compliance, right? Uh, and uh, and security. But then, uh, once you're entered into you know the DeFi world, you're still getting the best you know of bo both worlds, where you can get access to uh, decentralized lending and borrowing. For example, uh, Aave, Arc. They are the first one to partner with um, Fireblocks. Right? Uh, Fireblocks is acting as a whitelisted you know, features for institutions to verify the address. So they are you know, bringing in compliance features, but they are able to enjoy the benefit of Aave, right? decentralized lending and borrowing without the intermediaries part. And this innovation is fostering in a decentralized way in an open manner. Right? So think of it as a protocol, an open source protocol but a regulated open source protocol. That I guess this is the next trend that we see in the next few years. So Top, that's very useful. So basically you're saying that, look, there's a bridge between the DeFi world and the real world, you know, and that is where the, you know, the innovation will take place in, in, in the initial future. So Hans Paul, uh, I thought I'll uh, move over to you. Uh, you know, uh, so do tell us, you know, based on your experience, uh, um, how will and how are the regulators uh, looking at uh, you know the decentralized finance uh, you know one does hear about cbdc's um, you know what role do they play um, you know what will be the acceptance of that um, will it stabilize will the real world accept the decentralized finance world you know just your thoughts of how this will evolve i think i think top uh, you start the right direction uh, or the right topic by uh, saying you know we need to have uh, uh, permission uh, defi uh, because i think um, until I would say a few years ago, the central banks were not even willing to engage on discussions. And they said, we will not regulate because we don't want to give this space credibility. Um, because the moment we start regulating, you know, people think, okay, it's safe and sound. But the, uh, the central banks, the regulators actually did not really understand what was going on. And, uh, you know, of course, people were putting all kinds of things into one bucket, you know, blockchain, crypto, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Everything was, you know, just put into one bucket. And uh, there were a lot of, um, I would say, shady deals, you know, um, you know, going around. And, and quite a lot of people lost a lot of money. You know, I'm just talking about also Bitcoin, you know, losing whatever half its value over the last uh, few weeks and a and, uh, couple of months. And, and so the central banks have been you know, unwilling and intentionally unwilling to engage in order not to give this um, the blessing or, or, or a, cre a credibility. Now, of course, it has changed because you cannot just close your eyes and, and see the world, you know, as you just explained it, you know, um, you know change, uh, uh, changing and, and, and uh, the central or the authorities, you know, uh, turning a, a blind eye. I think what, what is happening, so everybody thinks now about, uh, you know, uh, digital currencies, they think about risk management systems, compliance, you know, uh, making sure that participants um, get regulated, get the blessings, you know, fulfill certain um, uh, criteria. Um, I think we should not forget that there have been a lot of, um, you know, big problem areas. I mean, in, in Germany or Europe, we had Wirecard, you know, which was a massive, a massive blow to the authorities, you know, um, and uh, and so I think they will move step by step. They will always be a bit behind, you know, the uh, the innovations, uh, but they will come around, and uh, but they will uh, increasingly insist on certain protocols, as you said, to make sure that, you know, uh, at least they can weed out the worst um, the worst fraud. You know, they will not be able to make it full safe, but I think they will, uh, they want to engage, they need to engage, and, uh, but it, it really requires also um, a, a very intense dialogue with the players. So I think, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure you have this with the Bank of Thailand, you know, uh, where, you know, they want you to do certain things, they want transparency, they also need to learn from you. Uh, to say, you know, okay, this is secure, this is okay, we give it our blessing. Um, but the important thing is also to make sure that, the, uh, that there is um, a positive relationship rather than saying, oh, the authorities are too slow, we are just moving fast, and, and if they don't follow, that's too bad for them. 
because you know there will be uh, major hiccups happening, major fraud happening, and then you know it will also hit those who have you know a very good offering to to do. So I think being being really in, in close touch is important in order to make this work. No, thanks for that. I think uh, there's another concept which I thought I'll introduce to the audience, uh, which is DAO, which is uh, decentralized uh, autonomous organizations. Right. So you know uh, uh, the thought process which is there is that look, if the if the actual transaction takes place of uh, smart contracts, which means it is code written, can the regulations also be written in code? Right. And can uh, decentralized uh, autonomous organizations exist? So any views, any of the panel members, Akash or uh, Top, about uh, DAOs and you know, whether there will be some kind of a self-governance which will happen in the DeFi world? Sure. Um, let me give you a quick background about uh, you know, DeFi. DeFi is actually, if you look at it, it, they are internet protocols that are created in an open source manner, right? With limited, uh, they are limited open source internet protocols, right? Uh, run, governed by mathematics. You can create a decentralized lending and borrowing by you know, the logic mathematics. You can, borrow, uh, you can uh, exchange currency with another DeFi protocols, right? Um, but I guess DAO is another you know, protocol, and they are building blocks, right? And in the future, you know, uh, traditional companies can create a front-end customer-facing part, and they can embed in-app protocols. Similar to how we are using Skype right now, you know, we are using TCP IP as an underlying protocol, but Skype is humanizing TCP IP. So a, hu a common man do not need to know what TCP IP is, but a they are able to get message, you know, across cheaply, instantly, right? Or similar to how we are using SMTP protocols for emails, right? A common man knows how to use a, G a, a Gmail without knowing what a SMTP protocol is, right? So in the next you know, decade, there'll be many, many protocols for value exchange, not for information exchange. You know, protocols for value, uh, information exchange already happened in the previous decade with the revolution of the internet. Right? But now we are talking about the blockchain revolution. We're talking about you know, a new set of open source protocol that are, that are limited in numbers that can represent value exchange. So there'll be multiple you know, different protocols, similar to how we have HTTPS, TCP IP, SMDP, they, solve, they each solve different internet issues, right? With the blockchain, there are many other internet issues also, right? And there'll be companies that are building a front-end customer-facing part and humanize different set of protocols to get, to get customers you know, access to better services. For example, you said you know, there are like you know, 50, 70% un unbanked uh, individual in, in the Southeast Asian region alone. And the reason is... Oh, 30, right? Uh, and the reason is not because they don't want to open a bank account, but they're not profitable to, to bank them, right? Because bank has to open up bank branches, and these are like high, really high sunk costs for them, right? With the mobile phone, with a smart, uh, you know, mobile, fo uh, mobile first uh, nation, mobile driven nation, uh, everyone else, for example, in Thailand, we have 144% mobile phone penetration. With a phone that is connected to the internet, the un unbanked, underbanked, can get access you know, to DeFi, to, to financial services, you know, that are you know, cheap, cheaper, instant, global frictionless, via an open source you know, technology. But they are accessing via an, a centralized app. Right? That's, that's what I see. And DAO is just another you know, protocol that you can, you can pick and choose in an open manner. But uh, you know, I think we need to always be careful uh, not to say what is technically possible will also be uh, immediately accepted and also accepted by the authorities. You know, um, you know we talk about uh, you know, cyber security, uh, you know, we have seen cryptocurrency being stolen large amounts and so forth. So every protocol is also um, uh, you know, only as good as you know, uh, people you know, uh, you know, adhere to it you know, and people are not misusing certain approaches. So, you know, I think for the authorities, and sorry that I, I have to take the, the, uh, <laughs> the position of the authorities, you know, you know government uh, entities do not want to be told, you have failed us, you have not provided security right. to, to the people. You know, this is the, uh, the, uh, the greatest, um, you know, uh, accident that you can have. 
you know, and uh, so Wirecard was one of these disasters and so forth. And and you, you lose, you know, the head of the uh, German uh, regulator, the BaFin, lost its uh, position, you know, and um, lost its position. And I think, you know, the, the key really is to not just to think from the technical point of view, but also how can we make it work so that people, yes, it can be very cheap and you can really start uh, giving financial uh, services to the unbanked and, and make it really work. But I think, you know, there are also lots of ways of cheating them out of their little money, you know. And if that happens, you know, you have a huge issue. You know, we have seen this in Albania with some Ponzi schemes and, and, and. So, I, you know, I can give lots of examples and this is the worst thing that can happen. That's why I think technical solutions are not sufficient only. Sorry for being so, so a bit, you know, whatever. Um, blocking things. Sorry, no, that, Akash. Uh, Akash you're no, I was just going to say, look, ultimately people want to use something they trust. And most people trust things that they can understand up to a point. And I think between Hans Paul and Top, I think there's, there's a bridge because I think what Top's saying is, as I understand it, there's all this technical complexity, but there will be layers on top of it that demystify it. I think, Hans Paul, I, I completely agree with you that ultimately when individuals get burned, when they lose money, that's typically when regulators and politicians come into bear. We're just so early in the innovation curve on this. And just like, you know, in the 1850s, when there was a gold rush in the US and a lot of people made money, but a lot of people lost money. And that was the most tangible thing you could do, right? Uh, mine something out of the ground. I just feel like we're gonna have to have a lot of tolerance for market volatility, regulatory volatility, and uncertainty around this for a while. But we have to keep progressing it forward because the underlying technology, perhaps not all its use cases, has enormous applicability to the banking system and the financial system as it stands today. And that's, again, where I come out, which is, I don't know if it's gonna be DAOs and this, because like, you know, frankly, anything that, I think it's a pipe dream when things are fully self-regulating and I mean, it's wonderful and, and all of that, but the theory is wonderful. I mean, here we are, but uh, at the same time, are there use cases for that kind of technology, the use of tokens as voting rights and things like that in a lot of other day-to-day -day things we do? Absolutely. We just have to find, find those purposes. I think it's also important you know, I mean, ideally, I mean, or ideally or, or conceptually, you could make all banks, all marketplaces obsolete. We don't need them. We just need protocols. So, you know, your institution would be gone. Every institution would be gone. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we will see, you know, those vanishing who are not changing, who are not fundamentally changing and becoming part of uh, uh, the new protocols, uh, you know, the decentralized uh, finance world. Um, and it, it will, you know, we are already seeing, you know, that, that uh, uh, banks have very hard time, or some of them at least, have a very hard time to digitize, to really engage with their customers in a digital way, you know, in an easy, comfortable way, uh, low cost and so forth. And we are seeing banks falling by the wayside, l losing money or having very low ROEs and therefore also not getting the funding. So I think we see a lot of things happening already. Now the institutions have to take the next step in order to still remain viable, you know. And it will be a process over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and also the authorities will also try to, and politicians will try to slow it down because they don't understand it. Uh, because they are worried about, you know, reputation, uh, lack of trust and so forth. But at the same time, I think the real value proposition is to make it a lot less costly, you know, to interact payments, loans, deposits, assets of all kinds. And I think that is the thing why it will progress and uh, maybe not at the speed that you are seeing all the time, but it will certainly be ultimately successful and we'll see it over the next uh, several years coming. But it will require enormous change from all sides. But I think it will also require, you know, from those who are very impatient like you and say, you know, we can make this work within uh, a few months or, you know, within the next couple of years, also to, to be in a good dialogue so that you build the trust that is needed uh, with the politicians and authorities. Because, you know, if, um, you know, like in some countries, you know, they may just shut down everything because 
they lost control. Yeah. yeah. No, it's very true. I think uh, it's a fascinating discussion. It's nice to see the new and the old, and you know how it will correlate to each other. Uh, the you know the market opportunity, as rightly mentioned by the panelists, is huge, uh, in the sense that the cost to serve is so low, and therefore the attractiveness of the proposal on a long-term basis is real. At the same time, you know it's about people and it's about money. It's about monetary policies. And you know it cannot be in a completely unregulated and uh, an environment where you know everything is left just to code. Um, having said that, uh, I would like to open the floor to some questions. Uh, any one of you would like to pick up a question and ask any of our panelists, they'll be happy to respond to that. Uh, can you have, can you give a mic, please? Charles Dellinghoff from Goodbye Vantage. Um, I was just wondering what your kind of view was on the risks of money laundering and terrorist financing and also sanctions evasion on DeFi, particularly given how we've seen Russian oligarchs and others attempt to exfiltrate money via DeFi, blockchain, other systems. Thanks, Paul. This is yours. Well, you know, quite honestly, I think the authorities um, certainly a number of countries are way behind, you know, as even before the, uh, uh, the sanctions on oligarchs, you know, we saw a lot of money laundering via some Baltic banks, you know, or the subsidiaries of, of uh, Nordic banks in the Baltics, you know, uh, billions of money being laundered through them, and uh, they didn't notice, you know, and, and so I think um, we should always expect you know, people who have something to hide, you know, to use also the new protocols for their uh, purposes, you know, and it will certainly not get easier um, and uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, impose sanctions or to, uh, to avoid money laundering or to, uh, to uh, really detect financing on terrorism. So I think, you know, we, we should not get the, um, the impression that uh, protocols means really transparency and transparency for the right uh, entities to have. So I think there will be, you know, because the self-organizing mechanisms means, you know, everybody, I mean, ideally, everybody can set up something, you know, and if you find the right counterparts who share the same objectives, whatever they are, you know, good or bad, you know, uh, will be able to, uh, to do transactions uh, which others want to try to avoid. So I... Quite honestly, I don't see yet, you know, how um, the authorities uh, can uh, can do this, and I think um, the uh, DeFi will make it even more difficult, you know, going forward. Maybe you have different opinions. I sure. Think. Let me add another dimension to to your question. Um, there is there are technologies that, for example, I just visited uh, Chain Analysis in the U.S. They are pretty much able to trace everything you know from the origins original block to you know the finite block almost mapping your face onto the address right uh, really detailed right so there will be there'll be new technologies like Rectech helping the government for traceability part um, I personally in my view in the future all the tourists would be using paper money but all the common man would be using cryptocurrency right because paper you, there's no way you can trace paper money. But with the blockchain, it's all fully, really transparent. You can you know, trace you know, uh, all the transaction from the origins you know, to the finite block. So you know, th th I think there's a misconception on, on, on the technical side on, on this here. Um, and you know, tech technology always follow the same pattern. If you look at the 1990s, when the internet first arrived, you know, the government said it's going to be the end of the world if the tourists get access to encrypted messaging. Right? So it's similar here with the value exchange analogy. You know, before they had this worried about information exchange you know, issues, right? encrypted messages. Now we are doing, you know, saying similar issues for the value exchange, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you know, the, you know, we will find uh, solutions, just like the internet. But, but technologists will always, you know, uh, people will always find new solutions, you know, and they may even, you know, outwit, uh, you know, what we now today think, you know, is uh, is absolutely secure. So I, I also have, you know, high, um, um, I would say, high regard for for you know the the people in technology to find more and more complicated solutions, you know, and so, so we'll see. You know, I hope you're right, um, but I I believe, you know, that. Um, 
the, the, uh, the bar is being constantly raised in terms of what needs to be done in order to avoid you know, the, the wrong transactions. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you, is there a mic here, please? Uh, I want to join what you say about the reputation of all, uh, uh, of all the industry. So uh, we're talking about decentralized and uh, controlled by many people, but often we find or we hear in terms of reputation that it was actually centralized by a guy that died in India or a guy that lost the keys. Uh, and the question is like, you know, they say it's not yeah. the cloud, it's just someone else's computer. My question is, is it decentralized or is it just centralized in someone else's computer? Can I quickly answer that, that, yeah. that question? You're talking about different layers here, right? What's happening on the news is the centralized layer part, not the decentralized layer part. I guess the best analogy is to use the, the banking in the sector. Imagine uh, there are two la layers, the protocols, protocol layers or the cash layer. And then you have this uh, financial institution layer. What's happening in the news is you know, one financial institution may be complacent, maybe forgot to hire a security guard. So a thief can come in and you know, rob a, a bank branch, one of the bank branch. But it doesn't mean that the you know, fiat currency, there's something wrong with the fiat currency. There are different layers. Right? What's but, happening in, 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 on the news is just uh, one of the exchange, one of the branches you know, were complacent. They keep the private key. Uh, online, but it doesn't mean that you know, all the protocols have flaws in them. Yeah. There are two, two, two layers here. Right? And but the DeFi layers we're talking about is the, 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 the decentralized part. But it does get back to the point about accountability. Yeah. So ultimately, when something breaks like that, malfeasance or, you know, whatever, who's ultimately held accountable, both individuals and institutions. And I think this is where going back to governance, we actually don't have clarity around it, right? You don't know who to go after. Mm. I think using top your analogy, whatever happens, even if it's at the bank level or at the cash level, the bank goes to jail. Yeah. That's how our, our model works today, for better or for worse. Mm. In this new world, we don't actually know uh, where, and I think again, People don't trust systems with everything until you know that there's a mechanism for enforcement. And we just don't have that consistently yeah. yet. Yeah. Um, but I agree, a lot of this is still just new cycle stuff as well, Top. So I, I mean, yeah. it's, it's also there. Which is why, uh, if, you, if you remember the slide which I put up, you know, which had like these two, uh, you know, two you know, pie charts and the van in the middle. So the van in the middle is where I feel that you know, it will be a combination of uh, you know, the blockchain technology. So you have the efficiencies coming in. And then you have the regulators, you know, having a kind of an oversight, um, so that the products which are there, you know, are governed to some extent. I mean, it's not a truly decentralized ledger, but it is centralized. But it has the advantages of uh, the chain. You know, I, I think perhaps that could be a, like, a, as I mentioned, zero to five year kind of a horizon. Right. Uh, in, in the meantime, you know, it may take time for the everybody to understand technology and kind of. What are the risks involved, as you mentioned? Yeah. I think you know you, you mentioned the uh, information protocols. Think about all the uh, the regulation that we see now in in social media. You know, hate mails and uh, <coughs> and uh, the whole issue around privacy. And, and and you know, of course, it was good that you know everybody can communicate with everybody. But then we also find we don't like certain things. You know, then we try to rein in. You know, and uh, and so. Uh, you know, so we talked about self-regulation, you know, the Facebooks of this world have to take down hate mails uh, and hate messages and so forth. And that only works for a certain amount, uh, in a certain way. Then you, you, governments impose laws saying, you know, if you don't take them down, you have to pay certain fines. And, and, and now, you know, these social media companies have, you know, thousands of people who uh, go through the messages, you know, and try to take down things. You know, I think we... Um, and I really sound like an old man now. I mean, I, you know, I think you know we, we are always somewhat behind, you know, and and the, uh, and uh, and it will take quite a while until we come to grips, and we will never fully come to grips with everything because we always will be behind the curve a bit, you know. 
and, uh, and in, in no way do I want to doubt your best intentions. And I think you know you will make it work. But I think there will be others with less good intentions, you know, and and use um, you know uh, DeFi in a way that you would not like to uh, to have it used. Yeah. I think social media is a good good example here. Mm. Like if you don't like something, we regulate on the centralized upper upper centralized layer. But we don't go down and regulate at the TCP IP level, right? If, if you don't like email, we regulate at the Gmail or Google, right? Those, those are the guys you talk to, but you don't go and regulate SMTP protocol. TCP and SMTP protocol are open, open source. It's peer-to-peer -peer review. It's governed by logic of mathematics, right? And it's in the long run, since it's open, it's going to be like a DNA mutation. The longest, gene, uh, longest gene, gene would survive by natural selection, right? So as a DeFi protocol, um, you know, it's going to be like DNA mutation in, long, in the long run. It's going to evolve in, in an open manner. The, the strongest protocol would survive. Uh, similar to TCPAP, which had competition in the past. It's MTP, which has competition in the past. But then you will up regulate on the centralized, you know, you know, institutions where they, you know, input in-app DeFi in them. You regulate at the upper centralized layer. I think that's what I foresee. Thanks for that top. Um, uh, any questions? Anyone uh, would like to ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, hi. So I wanted to specifically pick up on trust uh, point and in context of smart contracts. So would the common man on the street have more trust in smart contracts because the business logic is built into the contract itself and technology decides it? Uh, and let's uh, talk a use case of an insurer where you know, there is this fear that the insurer might not give me a payout. Uh, so would there be a tr greater trust in the smart contract because it's technology? Or would there be a lesser trust in smart contracts because it's technology? So um, I always find it dangerous to talk about what the common man or woman uh, thinks about when sitting in Davos. So, you know, I, I'm going to hesitate from that. Uh, but um, I will tell you, we, we haven't released the results of this, but it's a, a survey we've done in partnership with the World Economic Forum that looks at retail investing. I'm just trying to draw an analogy. So we, we've surveyed thousands of individuals in a bunch of markets from the US to Brazil to India, so on and so forth. And one of the questions was, ultimately, do you trust an app to do investing? And these are you know, low income to medium income people versus all the other forms, you know, a financial advisor, a br bank branch, et cetera. And what was very interesting to, to us was across all age groups and almost geographically uh, benign, the trust rates are much higher than one would think. So people are willing to trust an app with a very fundamental thing, managing their money. And even if there isn't a bank branch, even Sorry. if there isn't uh, something standing so, behind it. No, no name that they can recognize. Well, I, I, we haven't gone that far. I mean, we, we, these are names that are recognizable in those markets, but I think the critical thing is they're not banks. They're not something with a physical, because in some ways, smart contract is a digital asset, but the point is you don't have a lawyer, you don't have a notary, you don't have like, you know, a sales agent coming to you with it, you know, for an insurance policy. And... I just think, actually, ironically, the rate of trust for this technology in general is much higher than we would uh, we would think. Um, so that's, again, a survey not actually knowing what the common man does or does Although not. Although I must admit, you know, when when I was doing my uh, my first online uh, purchase many many years back, it was just a, a video which my son was looking for and so forth, you know, and it was not a large amount. Um, so I went onto this uh, one, uh, you know, platform. I never got the video. The money was gone, you know. So I'm, I'm, you know. So I was a bit hesitant <laughs> for a while. I mean, that was many years back. Um, and of course, now you have uh, trusted platforms. You have uh, places where you know where you you go and get it. So I think, you know, um, I think that's also the the path we will see over time. You know, um, people need to establish reputations where. The app then, you know, you know, gives you some trust, especially when you give money away. You know, peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending sounds great. You know, deposits, uh, payments, and so forth. Um, but I, you know, I think uh, we need to have some experience, also some bad, before 
you know, um, there is full trust. Uh, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I would like the panelists to give some closing remarks. So, you know, my question here is that, uh, uh, you know, we all appreciate that perhaps the technology exists. Uh, we all also appreciate that the, you know, that the governance around that and the understanding around that, you know, something which will have to be built. And as this, uh, as time goes by, uh, more and more products and familiarization will happen. Um, but I would like all of you to hazard a guess. Um, do you think in 10 years time from now, D5 will have, and your guess, what percentage of the financial services share? Uh, well, I, I have to calculate my market cap based on that, but um, uh, I, I'd say um, somewhere between five to 10% of the revenues will, will five flow into that. 10 years, yeah. How about, how about you? Uh, right now, the overall cryptocurrencies market combined is around. No, not, market, not, not market cap, market share. But the market cap could yeah. be astronomical. Yeah, so, uh, but just to put share, things yeah. in perspective, right? Yeah. Uh, Volumes the market cap is yeah. 1.3, uh, 1.7 trillion US dollars yeah. right now. If you were to combine all, all banks the together. 20, no, I'm not talking market cap, because market cap is a futurist. I'm, I want market share. Understand. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. <laughs> okay or ahead. the global financial asset combined, maybe yeah, 500 yeah. trillion, right? That's right. So okay. let's say one percent okay. of all the financial, you know, asset combined is five trillion US dollars. Okay. Right now, 70 trillion to global stocks. You know, 100 trillion to global bonds. Yeah, yeah. All the cryptocurrency market right now is less than one percent. You know, not, not not even five trillion, and we haven't even discussed about metaverse yet yeah, or yeah, Web3 yeah. companies yet. Yeah. And you know, metaverse is AR, VR, you know, XR plus you know, blockchain, you know, and cryptocurrencies, right? NFTs. These are going to be the underlying infrastructure for so. for the way people exchange values in the metaverse world. So I think it's going to be bigger than what we think, and it's going to happen. I think everyone would be surprised how how by how fast the world moves. We're underestimating how fast the world moves. Uh, I'd say uh, maybe 10%. Of all the financial... Almost the same as what Akash said, right? Actually, I would go higher. Uh, but I must also admit that my past uh, forecasts, uh, you know, on many other things have been a bit overly optimistic. So I would have even said 15 to 20 percent. Um, barring some major, you know, financial crisis, which could be a major setback where you see have massive fraud or whatever happens. But uh, I could imagine the, uh, the process really... Um, accelerating, uh, you know, between, the, let's say, 27, uh, and, uh, 20, 27 and 2032. So, you know, we, we'll see a slow move up and then there will be an acceleration. So over the next 10 years, I, I think we could get up to 15 to 20 percent. Um, and, uh, but as I also had to caution you, you know, I've been always overly optimistic <laughs> on, on many developments. And, and usually things take, unfortunately, much longer than... Uh, than we hope for. But I, I think, you know, there is a huge opportunity for lower cost, for more inclusion, and I think that should be the driving force, yeah? And, uh, and really connecting a lot more people um, uh, in, in this world and making them part of the, the global economy and even the local economy, I think is really important if we want to, to raise standard of living, um, and we have to solve also the energy issue of blockchain, yeah, of you know, that's yeah, for sure. That is a big issue. So thank you very much. So it's between 5% and 20%. So anywhere between those two numbers is a good guess. Uh, but uh, really like to thank the panelists for a very interesting session. Um, it is a new subject. Uh, we are all dabbling with it. There are some seriously in it. There are some outside of it. Uh, but certainly opportunities exist, I think, as Hans-Peter rightly said that uh, the technology allows for inclusion to happen. And if that is the ultimate goal for financial services, I think it's a great thing to have. At the same time, the governance around that over time will develop and make products safe uh, for consumption. So thank you very much. Uh, and thanks thank for you. Thank you.